Welcome to the Dry Fasting Club and the beautiful world of dry fasting. I'm Yannick Wolf, and I hope to be able to guide you on your dry fasting journey. The following information is not medical advice, so please treat it as strictly informational. The Dry Fasting Club was started with the goal of bringing dry fasting to everyone, bringing science and experimentation to something that has long been considered strictly spiritual. The Dry Fasting Club is a place where new and experienced fasters can get accessible information. Dry fasting is the most powerful form of fasting, but with great power comes great responsibility, and dry fasting safely should always be your number one goal. Paying for a subscription on the site helps out by giving you access to some controversial articles that are hidden from search engines and gets you a quick one-on-one -on -one chat with me to discuss all things dry fasting and maybe even more. I highly recommend joining the Dry Fasting Club Discord group, which is free, where you can meet other dry fasters from all walks of life and with different point of views. The one thing everyone can agree on, dry fasting is the best when done properly. Now let's get to today's discussion. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about how long can you safely do a dry fast? And it's a very common question for most people because it affects you no matter if you're doing a one day, three day, or a really long extended dry fast. Uh, I've included a lot of questions into here. So as we go through uh, this episode, I will try to answer them as best as possible. What is the ideal time for a curative dry fast? No one really knows. Some people claim that the longer you go, the more healing will be done. I argue that may not always be the case. Yes, going longer usually means more autophagy or deconstruction, but at what cost to the rebuilding constructive phase? Can you go so far that you potentially damage benefits from the refeed and stem cells? In fact, the refeed is more important to healing than the dry fast, in my opinion. Both are necessary, of course, so it's actually the stem cells that rebuild the body, which is being damaged, which are most likely slightly more important. So there is a limit to how far you should fast. Is it until you pass both acidotic crisis? Personally, I think that the ideal length that you can and should safely dry fast depends on the individual, their fasting muscle, their weight, their illness, and their goals. Nevertheless, I also believe that going over nine days is not necessary and frankly may cause more bad than good. I am also a fan of fractional fasting and I am a fan of refeeding correctly. I'll talk about uh, both of these in a little bit. In this chapter, I'll do my best to answer questions related to how long can you safely do a dry fast and any questions about safety and duration of a dry fast. And before we continue, um, if you are looking for a protocol that talks about what to eat, uh, when to do it, how to prepare, how to refeed, and tips and tricks for your dry fast, look up the Scorch protocol on the dryfastingclub.com. That is my main protocol uh, where I try and keep it as up to date as possible. It's still a work in progress, but all the basics and the skeleton is already there. It should help you a lot, at least push you in the right direction. If you want to follow it, it is based on long COVID and autoimmune diseases, but I do think that it is probably one of the most powerful uh, ways to prepare and one of the most powerful protocols for dry fasting. So check that out. And before we continue, what is dry fasting? This is the obligatory, what is dry fasting introduction? This is for those new to it who have stumbled upon this article. Dry fasting is the abstinence of both food and water. Normally when people think of extreme fasting, they think of people only doing water fasting where they only drink water. Maybe they'll add things like electrolytes or black coffee and tea, and those are powerful fasts in themselves. But when it comes to the dry version, Removing all forms of food and water and living on air alone is something that most people consider impossible. Yet, dry fasters are alive, and not only that, in most cases, thriving. In fact, most fasters who eventually try dry fasting never look back. It's that good. You make sure you know, you just have to make sure that you know the ins and outs before attempting it. When you dry fast, you accelerate autophagy to unimaginable levels. You also pull toxins out of your cells at an increased rate. 
Water fasting, on the other hand, makes it so that your digestive system never takes a complete rest and your cellular water never gets a deep clean. The most powerful aspect of a dry fast is the unique hormesis or bodily stress that occurs without water. This stress triggers a bounce back response from your body that increases stem cell production massively. So it's like a free version of stem cell therapy. Dry fasting is so powerful, but with great power comes great responsibility. Dry fasting should not be performed until you have tried water fasting first and only should be started with short dry fasts in the beginning as you acclimatize your body to this process. Now let's get back to the main topic. Uh, how long can you safely do a dry fast? The first question, one of the, so I start with the most absolute, most popular questions that target the most important things. And the first one is what is the recommended maximum duration for a safe dry fast? This is a question that gets asked a lot. Different people will give you different recommendations on the maximum duration for a dry fast. Villanov used uh, the recommended nine to 11 days, and he now recommends seven to nine days. So that's something that we should take into consideration. Why did he go back? He also does fractional fasts. He's a fan of them. For example, a five day, three weeks refeed into a seven to nine day fast. Shchenikov, uh, the guy who started uh, dry fasting and really popularized it. He's the dry, Russian dry fasting doctor who Filanov actually uh, took the information from and developed his own protocols. And then you've got, and Shchenikov recommends an 11 day dry fast. So he's a fan of the long ones. August Dunning, uh, if you've read the Phoenix Protocol, you know who that is, recommends a seven-day dry fast once or twice a year. We've got Lavrova, another uh, dry fasting doctor from Russia who recommends cascade fasting. So it's a slightly different version of uh, the fractional fast. It used to be said that you can safely dry fast for only three days, and people would point to the 333 rule. And I believe that's three weeks without food, three days without water, and three minutes without oxygen. And however, it has been recently modified to five days. So now with a little bit more research being done into dry fasting and some papers being published, I think uh, a really big one was in 2020, it showed that a five-day dry fast is possible and not that dangerous. Um, so according to a few research papers indicating that patients dry fasted for five days without any negative health effects, granted these patients were not doing any strenuous activities during the dry fast. Um, they had water fasted in the past, so they were not new to fasting. And the conclusion of the research paper stated that the intervention of five food and water deprivation days in 10 healthy adults was found to be safe, decre decreased weight and all measured circumferences, and improved renal function considerably. Renal function is kidney function, and that's something that I try to tell people who panic and think that dry fasting is going to damage your kidneys. Yes, if you do it incorrectly or if you're coming from a position where you have severe kidney damage already, the, those things change it. But for most people who don't have crazy kidney damage and are dry fasting uh, relatively safely, you can actually improve your renal function, which is insane. Uh, I have a link in the article to the papers. So if you're interested in this or if you're trying to persuade someone uh, that what you're doing is not that dangerous or maybe you want to show them that there's an option with dry fasting for their own health, go to the dryfastingclub.com check out this article, how long can you safely do a dry fast? It'll be under uh, the questions tab and you can pull these research papers and give it to them. This specific research paper, Anthropometric Hemodynamic Metabolic and Renal Responses During Five Days of Food and Water Deprivation. If we go by this paper, we can say that it seems that a five-day dry fast is the current safe duration if precautions and preparations are put into place. So to answer your question, what is the absolute safest day or the most responsible safest day, we can say five days now. Um, according to this experiment, the 10 participants did not prepare in any different way. Right up until the dry fast, they ate what they regularly ate. 
Um, from what I remember, these participants were in Greece and they were regular fasters, uh, so water fasters. And I believe they did it for religious purposes. Uh, I'm assuming that they ate a, a fairly good uh, whole foods diet. The participants also went for a daily walk of around 30 to 60 minutes and followed their daily activities at a moderate level of intensity. After the five days, they refed carefully for three days, starting with water, then some juice, fruit on the second day, and a light meal on the third day. So nothing too crazy, but common sense where you slowly ramp up the digestibility of your meals. And that's explained in the Scorch Protocol as well. What does this mean? It means that according to this paper, it seems that a five-day dry fast is safe enough that it does not warrant too much preparation in advance. This is something that seems counterintuitive to the idea that three days without water equals death. Yes, granted that someone is in a terrible environment and performing strenuous activity, think hard labor, the three-day concept starts to make sense. But keep in mind that the participants in the study still maintained moderate activity. So if you are relatively healthy, what the, this means is that you can still garden and do small chores, even if you feel weak. While you are dry fasting, you may notice that you get lightheaded and dizzy when you get up too quickly. This usually causes you to stress out and to worry which in turn spirals you into negative thinking and you start attributing it all to maybe being dangerously dehydrated. What this usually means is that your glycogen levels are dropping or have dropped, meaning your water levels are pretty low and in turn your electrolytes are low. These three things play a big role in the lightheadedness from sudden movements and from standing up too quickly. Your muscles utilize glucose for quick movement while ketones are used for sustained movement. Don't forget that your body also produces glucose during fasting, and the mechanism is called gluconeogenesis. It's the act of converting glycerol and amino acids into glucose, so proteins and fats. During a dry fast, it creates just enough glucose to maintain bodily functions. So think of it like a thin layer of glycogen that allows you to do some quick movements, but that will take longer to replenish than normal. Um, while not fasting, you have a much, much bigger reserve of glycogen ready to be transformed into glucose very quickly. But while fasting, you don't have that reserve. So you have to think of it like a sustained burn of ketones. You don't really have that energy for those crazy pushes. So if you overdo it, you'll feel very, very depleted. But don't panic. The best thing you can do for this is to lie down or sit down and relax. Give your body time to re-establish homeostasis, so baseline. This goes for mental issues as well. There will be feelings of good and bad. You may get some fasting rage, you may get some depressive thoughts, but if you prepare for them, you'll have an easier time riding them out. A good mantra to repeat to yourself when the going gets tough is, this too shall pass. That was a big one. Let's move on to a second question. How does the length of a dry fast affect potential benefits and risks? This is another very popular one. People want to know how long to go for certain health benefits. So to start, there are two acidotic crises that can occur. They are usually around day three and day seven. It's a good average time. By going through them, you pass a hormetic threshold. And that's that threshold of extreme stress that your body needs to bounce back. Hormesis is the ability your body has to bounce back from stressors. So if you can dial in the correct amount of stress on the body, you can get a very beneficial bounce back. This is seen in lots of stresses that people subject themselves to to get health benefits. Think of heat stress like sauna, cold stress like cold water, muscle stress through physical exercise, and mental stress like meditation. In each of these scenarios, it's possible to overdo the stress and actually cause negative effects. Maybe not so much with meditation, but you can still burn out. So there are potentially some overdoing mechanisms. I have a graph in the article that's pretty interesting that you could take a look at. 
uh, finding the right balance of hormesis is key. If you look at this graph that I have posted here uh, about fasting benefits over time, you see that some people are using it as an argument that there are little to no benefits of fasting longer than five days. This is because as the blood glucose levels drop and stabilize around day four, your autophagy falls down and everything else stabilizes. If we assumed that this graph is correct, and this graph comes from mindypels.com, if we assumed it's correct, does it indicate that you should start from a high carb diet to get the maximum benefits of a dry fast? You could argue that if you are chasing macro autophagy or the most basic form of autophagy and to some extent micro autophagy because uh, that is a secondary autophagy that happens during fasting. But this chart fails to recognize that there are many more different types of autophagy and in this case completely ignores things like mitophagy, mitochondrial autophagy, chaperone mediated autophagy, and ribophagy, which is ribosome autophagy. So as the length of your dry fast progresses, your body, body enters into deeper ketosis. Obviously, uh, there's an upper threshold limit to how many ketones you can produce per hour, and that's ketones uh, coming from fatty acids, coming from your fat. And it's possible that the limit of these ketones is reached within five days. So imagine your limit being 100 ketones per hour, for example. Your body can't go hot to 110, just doesn't have the capacity. What this graph and others fail to take into consideration is that these high levels of ketosis are maintained once reached. Yes, some slight changes occur when acidotic crises are overcome, but the point stands. While these levels are maintained, we reach a max level of lysosomal activity. Uh, this means that our lysosomes are supercharged. Lysosomes require an acidic environment to function. Think of them like crocodiles that require sun and heat because they are cold-blooded animals. So in this case, lysosomes require acidity in the same manner as crocodiles require sun. When you enter ketosis, the breakdown of fat into glycerol and fatty acids occur. Look at the name. The name fatty acid implies it is acidic, and yes, it creates an acidic environment. Most of the time, our body is constantly trying to maintain equilibrium. So that's where a lot of benefits come from, that attempt at maintaining homeostasis. The stress that is induced on the body while it tries to maintain balance. This is also where the acidotic crisis power comes from. So in reality, there's not enough research to really know the ideal times. People can pretend to know what they are, and some people will say ridiculous numbers. Uh, and the worst part is that people try and pretend that they actually know the answers when you have to approach it from a scientific and logical perspective and be realistic and honest and sometimes tell people we truly don't know everything. We need more research. We have to be aware that the longer the dry fast goes on, the more dangerous and risky it becomes. At this point, it is pretty safe to say that the average human body can quite easily handle a five-day dry fast. The equilibrium in blood plasma solutes was maintained, and overall improvements were recorded even in kidney health, like we talked about with that paper earlier. However, we know that mitophagy is mostly stimulated through starvation and hypoxia, while microautophagy, ribophagy, and chaperone-mediated autophagy are stimulated through starvation and hyperosmotic stress. Hypoxia is the absence of oxygen. We don't lose oxygen during a dry fast, right? Well, considering a hyperosmotic state, which is what a dry fast achieves and deepens in your body, means that the blood gets thicker and draws out uh, water from its surroundings, so its cells usually, which means that the blood flow slows down, the cells shrink, and water is pulled out of them. We create Due to this, we create a hypoxic environment by dry fasting as a secondary effect. What did we talk about hypoxic? We talked about mitochondria and mitophagy. Oxygen still reaches the cells in this state, but in less consistent amounts, sort of like a calculated stressor. We're giving it enough. It's getting it in, uh, in pulses, but, but it's stressing the cells. Think of it like someone controlling a dam and releasing water at a slower pace. You'll still get your water, 
but you won't be able to gorge on it like our body does in a normal state. This is different from an actual hypoxic environment where no oxygen is delivered and the cell dies or gets transformed in a way to, de to deal with it, for example, to deal with an anaero anaerobic environment. So in that situation, it's terrible. And that's what most people refer to hypoxia. But in our case, a dry fast stimulates controlled hypoxia. Huge difference, huge benefits. Filinov and other Russian doctors can claim to have seen the biggest benefits with X amount of days, but we don't know if the biggest immediate cure is better in the long term, or if the shorter but more often fasts are preferable. We don't know the damage of pushing dehydration to absurd limits can cause. We do, however, know that there are powerful anecdotes of people healing with 9-day dry fasts, while some psychos push it to 15. Looking at you, Trevor. Uh, I've personally done a 9- and 11-day hard dry fast, and to be honest, I'm not really a fan. You can read about this uh, in my post called Read About My 300 Days of Dry Fasting Insights, and I have a link to that in this article. I also have a little bit of an image here, uh, and here's the Yannick Dry Fast Deep Healing Days Calculation. And you can see the dark squares as what I'm trying to allude to. And to, to take this into consideration, after 60 to 72 hours of dry fasting, you reach the chaperone-mediated autophagy level. It's at this level that the most powerful deconstruction starts to occur. Chaperone-mediated autophagy is the strongest form of autophagy, and it's in this time frame that I start counting the days as maximum healing days. You can see that with this calculation, you can achieve similar benefits of an eight-day dry fast by doing three four-day dry fasts. The difference? About 100 hours. Yes, I know that this drawing is incorrect. Uh, that 384 should have been 288 hours. We also have to take into consideration that the preparation and the refeed, it really adds extra time. Uh, what this means to say is that you can achieve similar healing with a three, four day dry fast and a one, eight day dry fast, but it will take much longer. And each fast will need to break through the first two days of toughness before the body adapts to its glycogen depletion. You can ease the situation by starting it off with a low carb diet and already being in ketosis. In fact, this is one of the hacks being used in the Scorch protocol, but there's a caveat, and you need to be aware that if you're pushing for a long 7-plus day dry fast, you need to hydrate with some low-carb juices as part of the preparation. So in those cases, it changes things up a bit. What it means, uh, what I'm trying to say is that for different lengths that you're going to, there are different uh, ways to prepare for an ideal situation. And in, these, in this case, if you're going for 7 and up, uh, carnivore zero style, zero-carb style diet won't work as well for those really long ones. This isn't to say that two to three day dry fasts don't do a lot, they do. If I were to gamble on an answer to what is the overall best fasting duration that encompasses healing but also safety, I would probably call for monthly five day dry fasts. And in extreme situations, push for longer ones or upgrade it to two five day dry fasts every month, maybe bi-weekly. Mm -hmm. If you are healthy and simply looking for general house cleaning, mitochondrial rejuvenation, and life extension, I'd have to go with Dunning in this situation and recommend a once or twice a year seven-day dry fast. There is always the stem cell exhaustion shadow that's looming in the background. We don't know enough about it. So if you're healthy, there's no point in pushing dry fasts too much. Just be safe. But if you're in a health situation that you need to get out of, it's worth pushing a little further. If you want to theory craft for your specific situation, set up a chat with me and I'll gladly theory craft away with you. All right, let's move on to, are there different guidelines for short-term versus extended dry fasts? I touched on this a little bit, but this is another very popular question. When it comes to short-term versus long-term dry fasts, you really have to take into consideration the timing of the refeed. A simple way to think about it is to realize that the longer you dry fast, the more important the refeed becomes. I've seen this a hundred times. 
the refeed needs to be gentle. And there are a few different ways that people can approach it. No matter what you decide to follow for your refeed, two key things don't change. One, always start with natural spring water when you break the fast. It's the first natural step in waking up the digestive system. You may be tempted to take fruit or coconut water, maybe some bone broth, but the safest and gentlest reawakening is through water. Therefore, remember to break a dry fast by turning it into a water fast. Now, the amount of time you should water fast after a dry fast differs by who you talk to. For my protocol, I ask that you do a minimum of six hours of water fasting. This goes for any length of a dry fast that surpasses 24 hours. Why complicate things? Some people will, will argue that you don't need to do it on dry fasts that are shorter than 72 hours. And if you're in a rush, sure, make small adjustments from a reasonable standpoint. But if you're doing long dry fasts, remember that water is first. Sip it slowly. And only then should you transition to a liquid caloric diet. Always focus on digestibility first. If you're doing under 24 hours of dry fasting, so you're just starting out, you're doing small numbers, focusing on what you can eat is not worth the effort as long as it is not processed and it is full of nutrients. So think whole foods. At these levels, your digestive system doesn't truly get a chance to shut down because you're doing it under 24 hours. Think of it like this. The first night, regardless of whether you started in the morning or the evening, will still have some form of digestion going on. It's only really when you enter the 36-hour fasts that your digestive system gets to rest. Think of it like the second night of fasting. That's your first night of actually no digestion and a lot more healing. I will go ahead and make a statement that anything under 30 hours of fasting does not require a lot of planning unless you are extremely toxic and suffer heavy detox symptoms. You should know this if you have already started with water fasting like you should. If you have fasted before, you will know yourself better. This is why no matter what, you should do a two to three day water fast first before ever attempting a dry fast. It's the smartest way to approach it. And you should always attempt dry fasting in stages. The body reacts differently to a 36-hour dry fast than to a 72-hour one, and especially to a 120-hour one. Jumping straight into a 5-day dry fast is possible for a decently healthy individual, and that individual should have water fasting experience, but it's still not advisable. When it comes to following a specific protocol like the Scorch protocol on your refeeds, you may notice that it's catered towards approximately 5-day dry fasts, the sweet spot that I like to follow. However, it can work for longer and shorter ones. Think of it like an accordion that can be stretched and compressed. Because currently, as of writing this, I have not compiled a full 7-day refeed, but there's approximately 5-6 to six days there. If you are doing a shorter fast, so something like 72 and under, you can take that refeed and imagine compressing it like an accordion. So compress maybe day two and three together, compress day four and five together. You should still go for the first day as is, but you can take a little bit of leniency when it comes to the food and borrow a little bit from the following days. And if you're going for a longer one, follow the first four days as they are, and then try to slowly stretch the fourth day Stack on some next level digestibility options, look at other protocols like Filinov's, and kind of work your way around it smartly. Refer to my digestibility list that's listed in the Scorch protocol as well. Does the body's fat content influence how long one can dry fast safely? This is the next question. And it's an important one. People always ask about this. How fat do I need to be? So does that fat content influence safety? Yes and no. Sometimes someone who is near the underweight BMI, the body mass index, can still dry fast successfully. It's actually surprising how low the body can go and how much we overestimate slash underestimate our fat content. 
If you are seriously underweight, something like skin and bones, then you need to figure out a way to fatten up. The goal of the dry fast and all extended fasting is to start deep ketosis, which requires fat burn. You need to release the fatty acids, which eventually get turned into ketones to both power your body and increase the acidity in your body, and we need these for the fast. This triggers most of the healing hormetic stress effects, as well as stimulates the immune system and autophagy. If you have an impossible time gaining weight, there may be something off with your body, and a water fast may be preferable to try to fix your metabolic pathways for gaining fat. There are also specific food combinations that help gain fat quicker, such as mixing sugar and fat together. Nature's fattening up formula, for example, is raw cow's milk, so that is also something you can consider. If lactose is an issue, look into something like kefir and sweeten it with natural sweeteners like honey, maple syrup, and blackstrap molasses. Those are very healthy, high glucose and energy foods. A higher body count content makes combined fasting easier. It also makes fractional fasting easier. Both of these methods that make do with a shorter dry fasting time frame but have powerful effects nonetheless. Let me just quickly explain them. For combined fasting, you usually look at two to three days of dry fasting, followed by about seven to 10 days of water fasting. This is a way for the person who is scared of dry fasting to limit it to the beginning of the first acidotic crisis, that's around day three, and then to continue in the method of fasting that may feel safer to them. And in this case, that would be water fasting. Because you have a higher fat content, you can push the water fasting for a very long time and not worry about your BMI. For fractional fasting, you look at breaking apart a 9 or 11 day dry fast into two smaller dry fasts, something like a 5 day into a 7 day dry fast. The effects are very similar. And some will even argue that fractional fasting is more powerful because there is a compounding effect that builds even during the refeed. So the way to conduct this is to refeed for a minimal amount of time in between. This means about the same amount of days as the days you fasted. In the specific case of five days of dry fasting into five days of refeeding and then into seven days of dry fasting. In fact, I truly believe this method is much stronger than a single 9-day or even 11-day dry fast. I won't get into the details too much, but in these types of fasts, you want to start from a healthy or even overweight BMI because your refeed will be in small amounts of food where you should not be aiming to regain weight. So you're basically eating uh, a low, an under-caloric uh, you're not eating a surplus, you're eating under your caloric daily maintenance. You will undoubtedly regain a lot of water weight, but with a proper refeed, you will gain minimal fat. Normally, the fat regaining is done after the refeed and before the preparation period. All right. How can you determine your body's tolerance and readiness for longer dry fasts? This is a hard question. It really comes down to experience, diet, and fasting muscle. Men have an easier time than women, that's a fact. For a woman to get to 9 days takes much more perseverance and mental fortitude than a man would. Women's bodies have a higher metabolic requirement, especially pre-menopause. There may also be something evolutionarily where men may have had to go out for multiple day hunts if they could not catch anything at first, while women were able to stay behind where the food storage was. You can also test your body's tolerance and readiness for longer dry fasts by its ability to withstand things like the intestinal Epsom salt flush or a liver flush. If you truly struggle with these flushes, it may mean that you need to regenerate your organs and your digestive system a little bit more before engaging in a really long dry fast. Read more about this in Intestinal Cleanses for Dry Fasting. I have a link here. Dry fasting experience means that you understand your body and how it reacts to the acidotic crisis. It means you understand what days will be the hardest and what to expect on each day. It means you know when to expect mood swings and you can also experiment with different supplements and protocols to compare to your previous dry fasting experiences. 
It also means that you prepare for the dry fast intentionally and are aware that it's in your best interest to take digestibility into consideration when you're preparing and when you're refeeding. In this world of dry fasting, experience is critical. A lot of new dry fasters commit a lot of early mistakes that set them back. The worst thing I see quite often is a new dry faster making terrible mistakes not knowing when to quit the dry fast. But something even worse is when they completely mess up the refeed. It's usually because of this that a new dry faster might never dry fast again or may cause damage. Your diet and experience with ketosis play a role in your body's tolerance for a longer dry fast. If you've never been in deep ketosis before, you will have quite a shock once your glycogen stores get depleted. The body will give you a big WTF moment. This is an example of metabolic flexibility. A body that has not experienced ketosis will be confused when it comes to fat burning. Many people who constantly snack and eat high carbohydrate foods will always have full glycogen stores. And this is what athletes want. If your glycogen dips and blood sugar goes down, you may be in for a world of pain. This all goes to say that if you eat a ketogenic diet, carnivore, or intermittent fast regularly, your body knows what ketosis is and has the ability to switch between glucose and fat burning much easier than someone who doesn't. This also prepares you better for fasting. Here's the kicker though. Even if you think you're a champ at intermittent fasting and keto, a dry fast can and will still kick your butt. The first time you introduce a hyperosmotic state, one filled with thicker blood and a very fast acidotic crisis, you may feel wrecked. It's for this reason that for most people it is recommended to take dry fasting in steps. Start with one day, move on to two, then three, so on and so forth. I personally prefer a faster approach and usually recommend going for 36 into 72 into 120 hours instead. If, however, you have severe illnesses and are contraindicated, like having diseases of the blood or kidneys, you should start off experimenting with longer water fasts or take it as a one-day progression. Sometimes to be even safer, you take it in 12-hour progression steps. One day dry fast into one and a half day into two days with obvious refeeds in between, etc. Another consideration is how much toxins you have stored in your fat cells. If you're coming from years of eating processed junk food and toxins, they will have accumulated in your fat cells. As you lose fat, the toxins grow in concentration in the blood. A dry fast equals very quick fat loss, so you can quickly get into a detox crisis characterized by extreme nausea and headaches and other symptoms. You may need to break the fast in these situations, refeed, and try again. This is because your body can only detox at a certain pace, and many times that threshold for detoxing gets surpassed. The beautiful thing about this process is that each time you refeed with good food, the fat that gets replaced is cleaner fat. That means that your subsequent fasts will be running on a higher percentage of better fat. This fat will have fewer toxins and a much better nutrient profile and vitamin profile, compounding into an easier fast. This is part of the reason why people that have the fasting muscle, uh, or people say that the fasting muscle is important, because it also encompasses cleaner fat cells over time. Dry fasting is not a joke. However, if you're young and looking for a rejuvenation hack to stay young longer, forever, be faster and smarter, then you can tackle dry fasting with passion. If this is you, you've most likely already done fasts of varying lengths and have just discovered dry fasting. No matter what, there are still mistakes that you should avoid because they can set you back and in a worst case scenario cause damage that may be very hard to heal. If you are a self-experimenter and have your own anti-aging stack, Maybe set up a chat with me so we can compare notes and you can ask all your crazy questions. Let's move on to what signs or signals should you watch out for when it's time to break a dry fast? Something that you need to take into consideration, but as a newbie to dry fasting you may not fully understand, in certain situations you can take in some water and still continue your dry fast. 
Sure, a hard dry fast is the absolute optimal version, but there are a little leeways that you can take and still greatly benefit and make things easier. Anyway, back to signs and signals. Number one, extreme fear. If you have not dry fasted before, you should not be pushing yourself too far too early. Without getting through the stages of dry fasting first, you will build up fear in yourself. This fear is not a joke. Mental is an important aspect. If you panic and continuously worry if you're going to survive this dehydration, you will activate negative stress responses in the body that can worsen your fast. Remember, people dying stuck underground are panicking and dying from thirst and hunger after 72 to 100 hours. Yet, we are doing the same thing comfortably because we are choosing to abstain. There's a difference, and the more you do it, the further you'll go, and the more you'll understand this concept. Sort of like an enlightenment. Sign number two, pH in the urine. pH in urine is a good indicator to see if you enter the acidotic crisis. If you're tracking your ketones and urine pH, you can see when you enter the acidotic crisis. A steady rise in ketones sometimes sharply increases and the urine pH drops from baseline by about 1 to 1.5 points. Usually baseline is 7 and can be a bit lower if you are on a strong keto and low carb diet. It can be a little bit higher if you're on a very alkaline diet. Once you clear the acidotic crisis, it's possible to observe the pH go back up by approximately half a point. If your pH drops by two or more, you may be in a situation that needs to be looked at more closely with a few more data points to be able to make the right call. A third sign is the amount of urine. So if you're collecting your urine during a dry fast, the amount of urine can be a good indicator. If your body suddenly stops producing urine or is much less than your baseline, which should be established around day three of a dry fast, then it is a signal that there may be some intoxication blockage and fat is not being met metabolized correctly. Not many people use this strategy because it requires collecting urine, but it is a good tool for those who are curious and those who want to be extra cautious. You can also use this collection strategy to prove to others that your body does indeed keep peeing days after not having had any water. And you can also observe how the urine changes once you enter ketosis and after the initial glycogen loss and excess water dumping. Another thing is heart rate over 120 beats per minute. This is your pulse. Heart rate, uh, heart's beat per minute. The simplest calculation is to manually find your pulse by placing the index and middle fingers on the inside of your wrist or on the side of your neck, your carotid artery, just below the jawline. You count the amounts, the amount of heartbeats in 10 seconds, then multiply by 6 to get a full minute. During your dry fast, you may come into moments where your pulse goes as low as 40 or as high as 100. This is fine. If your pulse is going extremely high or dropping extremely low and you feel horrible, both weakness and pain, then it's something to monitor. Sit down, relax, and count again. If it's above 100 for an extended amount of time, while you're sitting down and resting, then we have a problem. You have two options. The first is to take a warm bath with some magnesium flakes and try to relax. The second one is to take a little bit of warm water or hot water, about 125 milliliters with a tiny amount of honey, a quarter of a teaspoon. This may be all it takes for you to, to be able to continue the dry fast. And if depending on the situation may be worth it. Otherwise, if it stays up, or if you re feel really bad and are mentally over everything, break the fast and begin the water refeed protocol. Another signal is insomnia over 48 hours. So if you really want to push the boundaries, you can extend this signal a little bit, maybe to the into the third day of insomnia. But if you literally cannot fall asleep for two to three days straight, it's best to break the fast and give your body at least one month of refeeding and rebuilding before trying again. Something is seriously off with you and be glad you're finally on the path of fixing it, but don't rush it. There are a few tips and tricks in the Scorch protocol to deal with sleeping, but if none of them work, then breaking the dry fast is very important. Another signal, the last one here, is intense unforgivable nausea, headaches, and detox symptoms. It could be that the lymphatic system is not being drained effectively or overdosing on toxins. 
And the same goes for the blood, as fat cells are burning and releasing toxins into your blood. You need to remember that dry fasting affects electrolytes, dehydration levels, blood pressure, and blood sugar on top of all of the toxin release. Sometimes it may be too much and the fast should be ended, then repeated once you are ready again. So allow your body to chip away at those levels of toxins. Now we have another question. Is there a general rule of thumb for beginners who are trying dry fasting for the first time? So just a general rule of thumb. Mine is start slow and build your fasting muscle. I also put into the article an interesting thing. So this is from Filanov. Yogis recommend fasting on a certain day of the week according to the date of birth. This day almost always coincides with a good day for different horoscopes. So this is pretty interesting because I guess depending on your birthday, there is an ideal optimal day for fasting. Maybe your favorite day of the week. And it actually works for me. I am a Pisces and Thursdays always feel like the best time for me to fast. And it feels like a great time for me to start a dry fast too. I am running a poll on the Discord server. So this is the free dry fasting club Discord server that I uh, recommend that you join to talk with other dry fasters. And I put a poll up there, just started it off and already... Everyone who's replied to the poll said they agree with this chart. So it's pretty interesting. Let's move on to what research or expert opinions provide insights into safe dry fasting durations. So this question asks for proof of safety and recommendations. A solid five-day dry fast research paper is a good indication of water and food deprivation. We don't have research that goes further than five days. There are Russian papers that you could get and translate if you are so inclined. Uh, this is something that maybe I could perhaps collaborate with Sergei Filinov on in the future. Uh, the first paper is called Dry Fasting Physiology Responses to Hypovolemia and Hypertonicity. It happened in January 2020. I think it's one of the most important papers. 10 participants performed dry fasting for five consecutive days. Potassium was constantly excreted. Sodium excretion slowed down deeper into the fast. This corroborates the idea that you should not eat sodium after the dry fast, including baking soda, which contains sodium. But that supplementing potassium is highly recommended and may bring a lot of relief. The study also showed how important vitamin C is and how fast you lose it during a dry fast. However, eating citrus right away is contraindicated through mainly trial and error. But by using this site and using science and understanding uh, that your teeth are very sensitive, actually understanding two things. One, your teeth are very sensitive after a dry fast and citrus can destroy your enamel and your teeth. And two, um, a high blast of vitamin C after your digestive system has been sleeping is also contraindicated and makes sense that the, uh, the acids can cause more negatives than positives. However, good sources of vitamin C are recommended throughout the refeed. Think raw cabbage into lightly steamed broccoli. And if you're looking at fruits, think about papaya. The study also showed intense increases in cortisol, dopamine, noradrenaline, and uric acid. And uric acid correlates to gout. And that's why gout is also one of the slightly contraindicated conditions for dry fasting. In my experience, and in my opinion, dry fasting helps gout. Yes, sometimes you may get exacerbated symptoms, but overall, you are healing metabolic pathways that should help you. If someone is extremely paranoid and wants to do everything possible not to get gout, then you are recommended to water fast, deeply water fast until your gout is sort of healed, and then you can move on to dry fasting. All right, a secondary study done by the same researcher, but earlier, so this was, I don't remember what year it was, maybe 2013, it's called Anthropometric Hemodynamic Metabolic and Renal Responses During Five Days of Food and Water Deprivation. And it says five days of food water deprivation contain a triple risk, hypovolemia, hypertonicity, and hypoglycemia. However, our participants have tolerated the dry fasting well, and none of them showed hypotension or any noteworthy disorder in heart rate or oxygen saturation, electrolyte concentration, serum osmolality, and glucose levels. 
it seems that a potent hormonal and nervous contra-regulation results in the effective management of food and water deprivation risks. Basically saying it looks like five days are safe. Another paper that I find very important and I quote quite often, hypertonic stress promotes autophagy and microtubule dependent autophagosomal clusters. And the study says the data document a general and hitherto overlooked mechanism where autophagy and microtubule remodeling play prominent roles in the osmoprotective response. Microtubules, lysosome pathways. Think of it as roads for transportation. <clears throat> the more you drive fast, the better your microtubules, so the better the roads inside of your cells, and the stronger the subsequent fasts. Not going to go too deep into this, but there is no other method that science has shown where you can actually fix your microtubules other than dry fasting. So that's massive in itself. What does it matter? It makes your cell more efficient. And honestly, microtubules are ne needed for lysosome transportation inside your cell. So put the puzzle pieces together with that information. Another study, protein misfolding and hypertonic stress. Uh, here it talks about the protein misfolding and it says most animals and cells are capable of adapting to extreme hypertonicity if hypertonicity is increased gradually over a sufficient period of time. More proof showing why you want to develop your dry fasting muscle gradually because most animals are capable of adapting to this. So this study proves that this is possible and has positive outcomes. There's a study called Ramadan Fasting Excerpts, Immunomodulatory Effects, and there's actually a lot of studies. If you type in Ramadan and you look at specific studies under there, you can find a plethora of studies targeting different aspects and showing the positive benefits of intermittent dry fasting. And the final one here that I think is extremely important is called Increased Fat Catabolism Sustains Water Balance During Fasting in Zebra Finches. The researchers in this study conducted a study with zebra finches, dividing them into three groups. One had unlimited access to food and water, one had access to water only, and the other uh, to no food, no water. After 24 hours, they measured the birds' metabolic rates and analyzed their body composition. Surprisingly, all the birds were well hydrated, even the ones that had zero water. However, the body composition of the birds varied significantly. The water-deprived birds were able to generate an impressive amount of water by burning their own fat. To dive deeper on this, look up for an article I wrote called Metabolic Water and Fasting, and you can learn all about how your body creates its own water in situations where it is deprived, and in hyperosmotic situations and deep fasting. How does dehydration... Okay. Before we continue, I know this has gone on for a very long time. Thanks for bearing with me. Uh, if you're still here, it means you really love the content and you want to hear more. <laughs> but I just want to let you know I still have a few questions to go through, but these ones will be much faster. How does dehydration risk factor into determining the length of a dry fast? So dehydration risk. And I wrote here activity level, humidity, diet before the fast, carnivore and zero carb already puts you into a lower water state. So just remember low carb diets actually dehydrate you. That's why going for longer fasts of seven and up is very difficult coming from a zero carb diet. I recommend the zero carb diet for fasts of five days and less as an intense and powerful, but super easy way for beginners to get the most out of it. Hopefully this makes sense to you. It's also in the Scorch Protocol if you get around to reading that. Are there any tips for gradually increasing the duration of dry fast to ensure safety? So the tip is to do short dry fractional fasts. Uh, it's recommended for everyone really. And it looks something like this. Fast for, and this is actually like the fastest way to adapt. Like if you're really trying to speed run it, fast for one day, eat for two days. Fast for two days, eat for three days, fast for three days, eat for four days, so on and so forth until you do a five-day dry fast. This is very, very powerful. Um, this isn't, this is, like I said, a speed run. Um, you can do this short, slower, and it'll be just as powerful. It'll just take longer, and it will be a little bit safer. <clears throat> How does one's age affect the safe duration of a dry fast? 
It comes as no surprise that your age should be taken into consideration when dry fasting. Common prerequisites include being between the ages of 14 and 70. What does this mean for kids younger than 14 who may require dry fasting or want to do it? Well, we enter into dangerous territory. The only thing we can do is dig into Ramadan practices and see at what age their religion allows the practice of fasting for children. And the reason I say this is because that's a many thousand year long religion. And over time, we can trust a little bit in their anecdotal experiences. So children must go through puberty before being allowed to practice Ramadan fasting. That would mean that the average age is 13 or 14. This coincides with Filanov's reasoning of 14 to 70 as being the cutoffs. Does this mean you shouldn't dry fast if you are over 70 years old? I definitely do not agree, but having these boundaries allows you to be aware of the dangers. Being over 70 years old means that you need to take extra care when trying to fast, especially if you've never done it before. It requires such a gentle approach that it's better to provide a blank statement like don't fast if you're over 70. It weeds out the people who don't want to do any research or have no self-control and will literally kill themselves attempting it. The ones who have discipline and understanding will be able to take the research that is currently out there and design the safest testing of dry fasting. This may look like doing the gentlest form of cleanses, eating carefully, and modifying the diet months in advance. Make sure that you that you start with intermittent water fasting and water fasts, and once attempting dry fasting, that they will start and increment it in little doses, like maybe 12-hour increases each new dry fast. Can menstruation impact the safe duration of a dry fast for women? If you feel fine, it's perfectly fine to continue the dry fast when menstruating. You should not feel bad for having to shower in this situation. Just remember to avoid getting water in your mouth. That's just the most important thing. There are a few different strategies that women can employ to strategically start the fast and end it to coincide with menstruation. So strategies on when to start. I may expand on this a little later or in a separate post. Uh, if this is the type of information you're really looking for, then I also highly recommend looking into Mindy Pels's conversations on the topic for dry fasting for women. Wow, this has gone on a really long time, but I think we are close to the end. The next question is, how can one monitor their body's signals during a dry fast? As I mentioned earlier, I talked about the different symptoms you need to track and measurements that may indicate that you need to exit the fast to stay safe. However, here I'll mention what tools you can and should use for this. I'll start with the most important to least important. Urine pH and ketone measuring sticks. They are very easy to acquire. Better to get multiple in one instead of buying them separately. The one I use is called Uranox 10. This will allow you to measure your ketone levels, which will tell you when you enter ketosis and deep ketosis. This also, with a drop in urine pH, can easily help you identify when you enter the acidotic crisis. Two, a blood glucose monitor. Some people use something like Keto Mojo to get both blood ketones and blood sugar. I use Contour Next Gen, which is a blood glucose monitor and requires an intelligent strip with each use. Some crazy people use a continuous glucose monitor, so CGM, um, and that measures your gl glucose at a moment to moment. Uh, in real time. A third thing is digital blood pressure monitor. This is optional and you can use manual pulses instead, counting it manually. It's simpler, um, but the blood pressure monitor is more accurate and it gives you your SYS and DIA uh, to measure the pressure in your arteries. A scale, pretty self-explanatory. Each day is slightly different. But once you enter ketosis, you can expect around one kilogram of weight loss per day. And this is a good uh, situation because if you're monitoring your weight and suddenly you stop losing weight deep into a fast, that could also be an indication to end it. Your body temperature. So using a thermometer, you can keep track of your body temperature. Those are uh, interesting stats to keep track of. And urine collection in mason jars or other containers. I already talked about this and why you may want to do it. Now we have, how often can one safely do prolonged dry fasts? And the answer is no one knows. Typically, 
as long as you refeed and rehydrate long enough, it should be safe. The minimum safest refeed length is three weeks, but may be as long as two months since stem cell activity has been shown to increase for up to two months after a dry fast. Dunning recommends one to two seven day dry fasts a year. And no matter what, a cost benefit analysis needs to be taken into consideration. If you are sick and dry fasting is slowly improving your life, you will most likely continue it. If you are healthy and doing this for longevity hacks and general improved health, you'll want to limit extended dry fasts to once or twice a year. I'd look deeper into Ramadan fasting and longevity studies if you're really on a path of trying to answer more questions for this specific one. Is it safe to dry fast during extremely hot weather? It's not ideal. It's possible, but you'll need to stay out of the direct sun and may need to take some ice cold baths or showers to cope with it. It comes down to common sense. Dry fasting is best done in colder weather. It is ideally done during the fall like temperatures right before winter. You really do get hot on an extended dry fast. If you are doing less than three days though, then it should be fine as long as you make sure you stay out of the sun and don't do strenuous exercise. Do hydration levels before starting the fast impact its safe duration? Yes, hydration is important. When going for fasts longer than five days, you should always make sure that you are well hydrated before the fast. This means that you had optimal amounts of spring water and juiced pretty hard. You'll want to juice low carb. This means staying away from high sugar fruit juices and focusing on things like coconut water, celery, cucumber, ginger juices. You can even throw things in like beets for a nutrient bomb even though I know that beets have some sugar. If you start from a very low carb diet with no juicing, you will most likely start on a slightly less hydrated level. This will make the first few days easier because your body will already be adapted to lower water levels and lower glycogen levels. You will already be in mild or moderate ketosis before entering. I hope that makes sense. Is it safe to do a dry fast while trying to conceive or during pregnancy? Once again, this is common sense. You wouldn't drink or smoke while trying to conceive or during pregnancy. Even though dry fasting has hundreds of anecdotes of helping women conceive, it does so by improving the body through stress prior to conceiving. This means that you'll want to dry fast and refeed before you attempt to conceive. I recently worked with a friend of a friend who had multiple miscarriages, and after taking a break and dry fasting, they have just given birth to a baby boy. And of course, you won't want to dry fast during pregnancy, specifically ex extended dry fasting. However, there are some studies on Ramadan and pregnancy. Remember, this is intermittent dry fasting, not extended dry fasting. I have a link to the study if you want to read about it. I think it shows that Ramadan fasting does not greatly affect fetal development. Some studies have shown that it seems to have no effect on the fetus, but it does positively affect the mother. I think any form of fasting during pregnancy is something that should probably not be done just to be safe, but I am open to new research on the matter and hopefully we'll get some in the future. Two questions left. Is it safe to combine dry fasting with other types of fasting? Dry fasting into water fasting is a very common hack that has been used a lot by Russian dry fasting doctors. A lot of people really like to prepare the body by water fasting a day before dry fasting. Personally, I'm not a fan. I prefer to go to the lightest meals and digestibility right before diving right into the dry fast. I do like to see a day of water fasting after the dry fast, but the minimum is a six hour water fast afterwards. And the final question. How do altitude, humidity, or atmospheric pressure affect dry fasting duration? Humidity plays a big role. I tracked this on one of my really long fasts. You can alter your dry fast if you use a humidifier. A pretty ideal humidity would be around 45%. <clears throat> but if you push this to 50 to 55%, you will notice a difference in your dry fast. The higher humidity will lower perspiration so sweating, and because of that, water loss will be less. This will allow you to continue your dry fast with more ease, but it may also lessen its strength by a little bit. 
hyperosmotic stress is one of the key drivers of dry fasting benefits. However, there is a sweet spot where you are already in hypertonic stress and you want to extend it while not going into deeper dehydration. In my experiments, this is around 50 to 55% humidity, but it should be focused on around day five for optimal healing, safety, and extension of a dry fast. This idea stems from dry fasting gurus who talk about the importance of sitting in a waterfall type of environment on really long dry fasts. They claim to absorb moisture from the air, which may be possible to some degree, but the slowed down, slowed down perspiration loss would most likely play an even bigger role. Altitude plays a role as well, since oxygen levels are reduced, resulting in slight hypoxia stress, which doubles down on the hypoxia stress already created from dry fasting, potentially making mitophagy twice as pronounced. You also urinate more in high altitudes, which may speed up a dry fast, although there's not enough information about this. No matter what, a slightly cooler and less humid environment is always prefer preferable for an extended dry fast. Wow, that was a long one. Thanks for sticking by if you're still here at the end. Um, I know there you may have tons of other questions about how to safely do a dry fast. I think I tackled some of the most common and popular ones. If you have other ones uh, and would like to chat about it, feel free to subscribe to the dryfastingclub.com under the members page. And until next, next time, uh, good luck on your dry fasting journey. And that's it for today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it and got some good information out of it. If you know anyone that this information could benefit, please share it. If you have any questions, you can leave them as comments under the website article at dryfastingclub.com. Don't forget to join the Discord group, and if you're interested in diving a little deeper, feel free to schedule a chat with me. I have many small hacks and experiments that have not made it into the articles yet, but may be suitable for your situation on a case-by-case -case basis. Thank you for listening. Until next time. Good luck on your dry fasting journey.